Okay. Without further ado, here is Pedro Rodriguez. Yeah, so thanks. Um, so I'm Pedro, I'll be presenting this work that I developed during my postdoc at INREA in France, and uh, it's joint work with Thomas Moreau, Gilles Loup, and Alexandre Gonfort. And uh, since I only have like 20 or 25 minutes to present, I'll don't be very deep on all the details, but if you are curious at the end of the talk about uh, readings, more specific details about uh, this work, the paper is available on this archive under this tag you see on the right. So uh, this general idea of trying to reverse a model from like you have an observation and you want to know what were the parameters that generated that observation. It's a very general problem in science in general, right? And also for people here in this workshop on ABC, they are familiar with this kind of inverse problems. So I won't be discussing too much about it. But uh, I want to start by this, just to let you know what was the specific topic of interest of, the, of this work, which was a certain class of models which we call a non-objective model. So models that by definition, the, the, the way that they are constructed, you might have several different theta that will yield the same observation x. So this class of models which are of interest in this work. And just to give you two examples of what I mean by a non-objective model, one would be the case like when you have a sound recording, like a recording of a speaker saying something, and you want to infer the distance of the speaker and also his voice amplitude. So you may not, you end up naturally on this indetermination of not knowing whether the speaker is close and quiet or far and loud. So you have this kind of problem. And also a more concrete example closer to the one of the applications that I had during my during this research is related to neuroscience is one where you have like an EEG recording an EEG just to, for those which are not familiar is a electrical signal that can be recorded on an electro on the, on the scalp of a person and it serves as a proxy to measure somehow the, the activity the physiological activity happening in the brain of a person when he's doing certain tasks and then when if, if you want to try to infer just from this EEG recording how the physiological activity happening in the brain went through the tissue propagation. You see in this kind of phenomenon, you have the physiological activity happening somewhere in the brain. Then this activity propagates through the tissue, the brain tissue of the person until it arrives at the electrode. So if you don't know how the brain tissue propagation behaved and you don't know the brain activity, so it may end up with just from one recording, you don't know whether the activity was a weak one that was amplified during the propagation or a very strong one that was actually attenuated during the propagation. So there's also this kind of indetermination that may happen. So these were the two examples that I want to give, but uh, the actual approach that we took to, to tackle this kind of, of problem was once you say, well, could we somehow leverage from extra information on this problem to try to crack this indeterminacy? And this extra information that I mean is one, for instance, in the case where we say, okay, I, on, I don't only have one recording, one sound recording, but also I know that there are other speakers that are at the same distance, an unknown distance, okay, but they are all at the same distance. And can I somehow leverage from this extra observations to know a bit better how to crack the indeterminacy and be more precise on whether what is the voice amplitude and the distance of the actual observation of interest. Similarly, in the case of neuroscience, I would say, okay, I am interested in one EEG recording, but I know that I have other EEG recordings that came from the same subject, so the brain tissue propagation is the same. And uh, can I somehow use this extra information to do something? And this actually is the standard framework for when you're working with hierarchical Bayesian analysis, right? You have this idea of global parameters. This is two examples is the distance and the brain tissue propagation. And there is also the local parameters, the voice amplitude and brain activity. And in the specific examples to, that I worked on, we were interested not only on the global parameter, but also the local parameter. We want to estimate well both of them. So this is the actual frame. So if we go back and recap to the title of the of the of my talk, you see that leveraging global parameters, now you know what I mean by this, these global parameters, but the idea of using a flow-based neural posterior estimation, I admit that, well, it looks at first just a string of keywords which are kind of uh, popular in the machine learning literature nowadays, and indeed they are. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be, try to be more precise and show how we use these kind of tools to, 
to achieve the kind of results that we have. So as for the background, uh, since I don't have much time and most people, most people here, they know much better than me all the, these tools that I'm, be, I'm using. I'll just try to be very brief. And just to give you the same notation so we can be somehow uh, consistent along the way. Uh, so in LFI or likelihood free inference, and also sometimes I'll be using simulation based inference or whatever, and this idea of, how, of trying to bypass the difficulty of not knowing how to write the likelihood of a complex model, of nonlinear model, that, such as those in neuroscience, for instance. Uh, what we do is that we sample several parameter vectors from a prior, right? And then we simulate several times each one of these theta i, a new xi, a new observation. And then from this data set, well, we try to approximate the posterior distribution using this data set. And uh, the traditional way one would say would be to use ABC, since we are in a workshop of ABC, well, this would be one of the ideas. But I didn't use this. Well, in the paper, we actually compared to the ABC and so on. But what we actually used, the kind of approach that we were interested in, was one based on normalizing fluids. So I'm not sure if previous works, previous talks in the workshop already defined well the normalized flows. But I suppose that some people here are already curious about this kind of approach. So I'll just try to give you a brief idea of what, a brief overview of what it is. A normalizing flow is this invariable net neural network that can learn to approximate any PDF. And with any PDF, I mean a universal approximator. And of course that in neural networks, when we see a universal approximator, it's just in the sense that, well, it would be able to approximate anything, but under a reasonable amount of time or a reasonable amount of samples, well, maybe it's not always the case. So there's a lot of research to get the more flex, the most flexible kind of flows to be able to portray the most uh, wider class of PDFs. And, uh, and the idea then is that you start with a base distribution, something like a normal distribution or Gaussian one, and you want to learn a transformation T that will be parameterized by this new network. And then each time that you sample a new Gaussian point, well, you get actually a new data point that follows, which is in this region, P of X, which is here below. And the idea then is to train your neural network so that this P of X, which is the output of your transformation T, will be the, close, the closest one to the, to the actual distribution that you're interested in. And the one that we are interested in in this in this problem of inverse problem and so on, is the posterior distribution. So our goal here, our approach is to say, okay, I will approximate my posterior distribution using a normalizing flow. And uh, of course that, well, when you use new, uh, normalizing flows, in the end, you're using neural networks. So the main challenge here is this lack of theory to know whether, for instance, okay, I want to have a certain degree of quality of my approximation. How many samples do I need? Well, these are kind of heuristics and uh, very practical questions that we don't have any, quite any actual answer to give. And I won't be assuming, but I cannot say given any uh, answer that are precise about this. So we just assume that normalizing flows is the tool that is useful for this kind of work. And I'll show you what we obtain as a result, okay? So as for the contributions, uh, I'll start with a very basic toy model, which is the motivating model that we use along the paper, because it's simple enough so that we can have all the analytical uh, part of it and all analytical results describing it, but not that dumb, not neither, not that naive, so that nothing can be told about. Because there's something interesting to tell, talk about. So let's start. Uh, the observation will be consider which are x, simply alpha times beta. And the alpha and beta are the parameters I want to infer. And the, I will assume that they are, uh, their prior distributions are uniform between zero and one. So that you, as you can see in the joint posterior distribution, they follow a line. If I have a certain observation x zero, uh, there are an infinite number of alpha and beta that will give the same observation. So you have this banana shape here in the joint posterior. And the marginals, they look like this, at exponential. So these are the values, the actual analytic curves that we can obtain. And the idea then is to say, well, I might be interested in one observation x zero, but I might have an extra set of observations with xi. So each one of these xi will be formed by an alpha i, which is this local parameter, alpha i, but they all share the same global parameter, beta zero. So this new set of observations x 
we will form the new posterior distribution that I'll be using, which is a P of alpha beta given x0 and big X. And I can factorize it, of course, as such. And then if I start to simplify things and take into account this hierarchical and the structure of the problem, as I'm doing the second line, and then I use Bayes theorem, and then I rearrange terms and so on, the last line here shows that the, this new posterior distribution that I have, as compared to the initial one, is a transformation as well. It's proportional because I have to take the normalization constant, of course. But the thing is that we see that there's some kind of transformation coming from these extra observations going on on my initial posterior distribution. And it's exactly this kind of effect that we were searching, we were looking forward, um, trying to, to grasp. So to these extra observations can help us to do something to change the posterior distribution that we would have with just one observation. So in the case of this very simple toy model that I'm showing here, what happens with this effect is that when you have more and more observations, for instance, 10 extra observations, you see that the joint posterior starts to get sharp, uh, closer, and how can I say, uh, less large, <laughs> uh, smaller around the region with the ground truth. And if I get even 100 extra observations, it gets harder to see them in the joint posterior distribution, but it's actually just a point in the space. So it's, a re it's really sharp, really sharp as seen by the marginal distributions, which are converting to a Dirac around the actual ground truth of the point. So you see that these extra observations are helping me to get to crack the indeterminacy of this very simple problem. Now these results is black curves and so on. The, what I get is uh, analytical ones. So these are not obtained by MC or, or whatever. So the approach then that we said well was to say, okay, on this toy model, things looks to have to, to behave as we want it. So we'll be using actually uh, this factorization that I'm showing here on the slide. And I'll say, okay, I'll approximate the first factor by a normalizing flow, one that will be responsible for approximating the PDF of the local variables, and another normalizing flow, which will be approximating the one for the global variables. And uh, there's a specific uh, particularity on the second normalizing flow because I'm using also a third neural network, which is a deep set. I be, won't be giving too much details about it, but it's, the idea is that we have to handle also the fact that the extra observations, they don't have any notion of ordering. So things should, the things should handle these extra observations in an orderly variant way. So this is why we have this third neural network there. And in the end, well, we train these neural networks, these three neural networks using a classical approach using maximum likelihood estimation, where we're trying to minimize the callback library divergence between the posterior distribution of interest and now approximation. And we use Monte Carlo approximation with uh, SGD, stochastic gradient descent. And of course, well, this on this very last line is where all the difficulties, the challenges of using neural networks comes in. But as I said before, I won't be taking too much time to discuss about it. So on this figure that you see here, we see on black the analytical curves on red the actual ones that we obtain with this approximation based on two normalizing flows. And as well, you can see that things look very, very similar, but they are very uh, close to the actual results that we want. And of course, on the paper, we did more quantitative uh, analysis by taking the distance between the, the posterior distribution and seeing that things converge as we get, got more and more observations. So as a validation on a, on a, let's say, a sanity check on a very simple approximate, a very simple example, things seem to pass. So this is why we went, we went through and we started to work on a illustration that deals with neuroscience. So a very, a more complex and interesting problem. So this neuroscience problem, uh, I, I should uh, give a disclaimer right now is to say that Actually, the way that I'm presenting everything here is in reverse order because actually we're interested on this specific kind of model, the Jensen and Heat neural mass model. And actually, when we were working with this, it was when this idea of uh, indeterminacy had, uh, started to, to appear, this problem actually. And this is why we started to develop all the mathematical tools and the normalizing flows and trying to handle this problem that we observed on this very specific and applied problem. So, a neural mass model. I'm not sure if anyone has ever heard about this in the, in the community here. It's this idea of a, it's a very simple model that is very often used in neuroscience and computational neuroscience to describe the activity of the cortical column of the brain and how 
oscillations happening in the in the brain. So these EEG signals that we might observe in experiments, they are very well modeled by this kind of of neural mass model. And I'm sure that most people will be more comfortable with a block diagram like this, where we're mathematically squared and so on. So that biological model that I show there is represented again here. And I'll show just kind of the kind of parameters that we try to infer on this model. So we assume that we have an input driving noise that will be modeled by a mean and a variance, so it's in red. There's also a notion of an internal connectivity between the interneurons that interact between each other. I won't give more details than, than that. But we'll say that although there are C1 through C4, we can manage, we can parameterize every, all these four parameters via just one parameter, which is parameter C, that we shown that later on. And finally, there's also the cortical, the cortical activity, like the actual physiological activity that we are actually simulating that happens in this blue region. That is, we don't have access directly to it, but we actually have access to an actual EEG recording that was propagated through the brain tissue. So we will actually, in a very simple approximation, we're considering that the difference between the physiological activity happening in the blue spot here and the actual recording is one of a gain factor. So either is it being attenuated or being amplified. We don't know. It's something that has also to be inferred from the data. And finally, we use as summary statistics because we won't be handling all the 2000 samples of the time series each time we'll be using the log power spectral density which is a very uh, standard uh, spe uh, summary feature at, for time series in neuroscience so, so in the end our posterior distribution that we want is this one that i'm showing here and the thing is that well we have these four parameters for the actual easy recording and when we try to use just one normalizing flow to approximate it, like directly, we end up with this problem, with this kind of posterior. Here. So we see that there's some apparent redundancy in the sense that we have some regions for which, for the same observation, for, for whom the, the ground truth parameters are in black. Okay, so I'm supposing that I chose a certain set of parameters, which are the black dots. I simulated an observation X, and now I'm trying to take the P of theta given X, right? And so you see the regions of high probability that would yield the same observation. And actually, this is coming from the fact, just as the, the effect of the example that I've showed at the very beginning of my presentation, of this idea of having some activity which is weak in the physiological sense, that is being modeled by this input driving noise in the model, and also the brain propagation effect. So sometimes you might have a higher input power, meaning that I have is driving noise, which is very high, but I might have a small gain, which will give the same output as the other way around. It's a smaller activity, but a, a large gain. So knowing this indeterminacy in the parameters that comes from the construction of the model, we thought, well, we will have probably to use additional recordings to try to crack in the indeterminacy as I showed before. So what we did was to consider, okay, I don't only consider my X zero, as an observation, but also this extra set of the observations x1 through xn. So from this posterior distribution, I can factorize on the local parameters and the global ones, and I'll use a normalizing flow for each one of them and see what I get. So this is the result that I get. <laughs> uh, for those four parameters at the beginning were in blue, from what I was considering n equals zero. And then when I get n equals nine, meaning that I have nine extra observations, so it's 10, right? And my observation x0 plus nine, I get something that gets sharper around the black dot, the actual uh, ground truth parameter. And on the paper, I sh we show that for more and more observations, things get more and more sharper around the ground truth parameter. And of course, that the speed of this convergence is still an open question that interests, I'm very interested in, but we still, it's not very clear to us how to measure, how to predict would be, what would be the speed of convergence for more and more observations. But well, this remains as an open question. And then, just to, to finish up, I don't know if I still have time. Could somebody just let me know if I have two minutes or three minutes, just so I can explain the real data or not? You have, a, uh, you have about, um, well, five, seven, eight minutes. So, Sorry? Okay. You, have, you have over five minutes, at least. So OK, sure. Cool. So uh, just to finish up with this uh, with my presentation, I'll show also the results that we had on real EG data. Because uh, 
this kind of neural mass modeling and so on. Uh, the results that I showed just before was one when I had my neural mass model. I chose some parameters and then I simulated the, the actual signal and it was just uh, like uh, one where we had the ground truth, right? But actually a neural mass model, it serves to, is constructed such that it can model very well the behavior of the brain when it's generating something that we call an alpha rhythm. An alpha rhythm is a kind of oscillation that happens back in the back of your brain when you have your eyes closed. And it's usually an oscillation around 10 hertz. So you see here in the, in the, in the graph is when you have your eyes closed, which are in blue, in the spectrum, you see a peak under the 10, under 10, 10 hertz. And when you have your eyes open, well, things are just normal resting state Activity. And then our goal was to say, okay, I'll consider that I have one observation either from a closed eyed state or an open eyed state. And I consider also that I have an extra set of observations with from the same person where this, this person was either with eyes closed or eyes open. So just, just as the, the setup that I had just before. So in this case, what do we get? Now, I'm sorry, but the colors, they change, the logic of colors, they change, because now I'm considering in this plot what happens when I have no extra observations, but the colors show the results when I have closed eyes or open eyes. So my observation is coming from an EG recording with closed eyes or a observation with open eyes. And you see that, well, when you have only one observation, you have this kind of results. However, when you have these extra observations that you're considering, you start things the, your posterior distribution, although you don't have any ground truth parameter, right? So things are kind of hard to say anything more precise than that. You see that things are clustering around a certain certain values. And it's very nice to see this because actually when you go see in the literature for neural mass models and physiological studies around this kind of model, you see that actually when you have eyes closed, which is one, which is when your um, your ED is on alpha rhythm, the actual value for C is really around 135. It's really like the actual value for a parameter to be able to make the neural mass model oscillate around 10 Hertz. And when you have your eyes open, well, things are kind of messy and more of a resting state, but usually the way that you model it on the literature is to choose around 68 or uh, 70 for C. So things are very nice, very well indeed, uh, represented on this kind of result here. And as for the other uh, parameters, you can see that from having just one observation and more observations, things get more sharp and more uh, close to the, a certain region which a with a value that well. I am not, I'm no neuroscientist to say, to see whether mu and sigma mean something in a physiological way or not. So to conclude, I would say that, well, this parameter indeterminacy is a challenge in non-linear non inverse models in general. And using this Bayesian approach, this Bayesian approach I mean by uh, saying that the solution of the non-linear inverse problem is not simply one value, but actually a dense, a probability density function is very powerful and allows us to actually describe things in a very natural way and also to rewrite things and take into account the, high, the structure of the problem. So it's a very powerful tool. Uh, we have, so as I mentioned just before, uh, we have explored this structure to try to crack with the indeterminacy. And I'm particularly happy about the fact that we took this, we were able to leverage from the structure of the problem and propose a way to an architecture that would use different flows and how to combine them. So to get a posterior distribution that was more precise and well constructed to the actual problem that we were handling. And uh, as for perspectives, I would say that one of them is exactly to choose another option from, um, for the posterior approximation. So one would be this glimpse that Florence uh, Faubin has presented yesterday and someone you might have seen. So this will be more based on something more uh, robust in terms of mathematical results and will be the lack of theory will be a bit better handled in this case as compared to the neural network case. And also we could consider the case, uh, the case in which would be more practical in the sense that, well, sometimes we, we would want to have the possibility of considering a variable size of X of this 
the number of, uh, of extra observations. And this is not the case yet. So this will be interesting to, to, to consider. And finally, the data-driven semi-statistics, which is something that is appearing more and more in the machine learning culture, uh, literature, is the fact of trying to learn what would be the best summary statistics using a neural network or something else in the optimal sense, just from the data. So not fixing the fact I'm using only power spectral density or whatever. So this will be also a nice venue of research to, to go on. So I thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. So are there any questions? Yes, I, I have one. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks Pedro for, for the nice talk. I again appreciated uh, a lot, I appreciate it a lot. Uh, so I have a question on, on the um, toy example you, you gave at the beginning, where you have these uh, local and global parameters. And as I understand, they play um, a, a role that is asymmetric. Yeah. However, in, perhaps in the next slide, we seem to see that they are learned at the same rate, this alpha and this beta. So would you have some intuition why this happens? I would expect that one will not be learned as as efficiently as the other or maybe i'm missing something <coughs> that's very that's a very interesting question and actually uh, this toy model that we are considering here has this uh, particularity of the fact that well the the effect that alpha and beta has on the under the on the observation is the same, like they are completely symmetric, as you said. But then we only have extra observations regarding beta. And uh, why is that the speed of conversion, the speed of getting sharper and sharper for one of them and for the other seems to be the same, right? Uh, at least in, in a qualitative way. Um, <laughs> All, I'm saying all this just to say that I don't know. It's something which is an open question that we are still investigating. And actually, we were also considering other toy models, a more, a more interesting one, a more rich one, where we didn't have this symmetry. So even in terms of how each parameter affected the observation was different. So that to see whether how the speed of convergence changed for each one of them and why it happens so. So I. I I admit that I don't know why it happens, and it's something that we are still investigating to give to have a better sense of knowing just not just for this toy model, but for other examples and being able to see whether we need some kind of reparameterization to say, well, this would be a better parameter to have a global to consider as being global as compared to another one. So this is an, an open question. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? Keeping an eye on the chat this time as well. So I don't see any at the moment. I, I guess I, I had a question that was, I was just wondering about, um, oh, no, no, I'll let Florence go ahead. Florence, yeah. go for it. No, thanks, sorry. So hi, Pedro. Um, I was wondering, maybe it's, a, it's a, my question doesn't make sense, but um, uh, could we use your framework for uh, what's called a uh, data assimilation? Like, uh, let's assume that you, you have an inverse problem, which is, uh, uh, let's say you have 10 parameters, but your, your observation is only in dimension one. So it's not just that it's not injective, but it's uh, really undetermined. So what, what people sometimes do in this case, they, they had uh, information uh, like initial guess on the parameters or something like that. Yeah. And I was wondering if we could see that as a, it's like a, it's not really observations like your XI, but uh, in a way you could assume it's a noisy observation of the parameters or. Um, so, but I'm not sure it's interpretable in terms of global parameters. But, uh, yeah, because the way that we construct like the, at least the intuition that we use here was this idea of global and local, so the um, hierarchical structure of the problem. But I agree that there's also like um, this indetermination sometimes can come from the fact that you are simply underrepresented, right? You have just one observation for two parameters. So of course that you end up with uh, 
this, as you said, that you in your data simulation example that you just mentioned, and uh, it could probably be we have to think about the the possibility. We didn't think about this this uh, approach in this kind of application, but could be interesting to to take a look. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry that it cannot be more precise than that. No, no, but I think we should discuss that uh, later, maybe. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Is there anyone else? Um, okay, well, what, what I think we'll do is we'll finish the session there because it is now um, time. So thanks very much to all of the speakers. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give a, a quick